the startups that I'm working with and advising, we're trying to get through customer creation before Series A, because we want to go to the Series A investors and say, hey, we know the problem, we have the solution, we know the customer, and we know how to get to that customer. We've tested whether it's a direct sale type effort or whether it's online with inbound marketing, outbound marketing. We've tested all of those and we have metrics that say we found the most. So you go through LinkedIn and you say, hey, I want to talk to Jeff. And you look at who do I know that knows Jeff? Let me go to Jeff's website and see what companies has he invested in. I'm connected to the founder in one of these companies. That's who you want to ask for. Some sort of argument or discussion where VC saying do X, you're like, no, I'm going to do Y. And like you never come to common ground. How can a founder look out for those things? I focus on that more now after making 11 investments. It goes both ways. You want to find the investor that you connect with and think about it as a mentor-mentee relationship. Yeah. And I'll use this example that I heard from one of my MBA professors. He said, Welcome back to Funds and Founders. Today we have on Jeff. Jeff had an early career as a design engineer and a director of Silicon Engineering. He had a couple CXO roles, CEO at Omni Based Logic, CFO, CEO, COO at Nexersys, also known as XFIT Inc. He played various finance executive roles, VP of Finance at Graviton, which I think was an IBM company, fractional CFO, CFO at Longview Equity LLC for a couple years. Currently, he is a fractional CFO at Maranti Growth. He's the co-founder and a GP at Longview Tech Ventures, and he's also the author of the book showcased here, Fooled by Early Adopters. Welcome to the show. Thanks. I wanted to start off by asking you, what do you think product market fit is? And I ask because you've written a book about product market yes, fit. Yes, I but, <laughs> Uh, That's a great starting question because I have a book about product market fit. But let's start there and then we'll um, I have some follow-ups from. So I think of product market fit on a continuum. And so I think we talked about this that there's you start off with match, what I call product market match, which is used to be referred to as table stakes, which means I have to have a minimum solution in there that is as good as everybody else. And so um, that's like the first step. And then once you go from match, you can go to alignment. And that's where, you know, customers are considering you as part of the solution to their problem. So you have alignment with their problem. And then product market fit, I think of as um, what was referred to back in the 90s as being inside the tornado. And so that's like when Mark Andreessen says, you, you can't buy servers fast enough. You can't hire salespeople fast enough. And you're just, things are just going crazy. And so I like the, there's a common saying that if you're asking whether or not you have product market fit, you don't have product market fit because product market fit is crazy. So two follow-ups there. Well, if you can't grow fast enough, if you can't hire people, you can't um, scale, there's obvious bottlenecks because there's so much demand. Do you think there's a place for a product, a solution, a SaaS company where maybe they have a really good solution. They have really good fit to the industry and the customer they're solving. But it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, there's sales flying out the door and there's right. growth flying out the door. Are there those situations that exist? And the reason I ask is, I think there's a place for SaaS products to exist that are not your unicorn SaaS products. Not everything has to have 100 million ARR, 200 million ARR. Yeah. But they still probably solve a problem really well, fit in really well to answer the first, to that fit into the first half of your definition of PMF. Yeah. Do you think there's a space for that or? No, I, I think every company goes across that continuum at different stages of life. Like I would make the argument that Uber doesn't have product market fit. Uber has alignment. So when I think about I need to call a car, I think of Uber. Yeah. And so they're aligned with, in my mind, that solution. Yeah. Right. But Uber doesn't really make money. And they're not, you know, it's not in a situation where, uh, you know, one person gets out of an Uber and another person gets in. Yeah. They're not that locked into the market in that they're it's crazy and they can't hire enough. I think they do have issues hiring drivers, but I don't, I don't think they're 
at a space where, you know, they're essentially inside the tornado, which is what Jeffrey Moore called it. And I do, I think that the Uber is a long tail type investment and that the product market fit for Uber is when we have driverless vehicles. And so that's when they don't have to pay the driver and they can really leverage the, the fact that they kind of own the mind share yeah. of the consumer. And so that's when I think we're going to see Uber having product market fit. But that's, I agree. I think that, you know, there's, along that continuum, you could have a very successful business at Match. And you can have a very successful business at Alignment. And not everybody's going to get to this kind of panacea of fit. I like that you made the Uber example. I think what they've done really well is made a name for a problem that exists. Um, people refer to, hey, let's Uber there, not let's right. grab a taxi there, not let, let's find a ride there. It's become a connotation. And I think, like you said, mindshare is very important. And you get to the point where you will reach some sort of fit. I don't know when that is, what the turning point will be, yeah. but Uber is a good example because they've captured the mindshare. Even if I'm taking a lift, people will refer to that like, hey, let's find an Uber there. And then I'll open an app and figure out which app do I want right. to do. But the connotation of taking the action now, everyone else is always going to be a step behind because first market share is always going to be. Right. And, and that could have been the taxi industry, right? But they just they stuck where they were and they didn't take advantage of the technology that was available. And now Uber's uh, defined that new space. Yeah. I don't know what they do with 40,000 employees. I have a couple of friends who work at Uber, but we'll see uh, at some point. A lot of coordination, maybe. How do you think early stage companies, super early, and I like to focus on the early parts of a journey and I'm assuming most of my listeners are earlier in their journey. How should early founders think about product market fit? What signals should they use? Are there tools you recommend? Are there certain data points or metrics? And I know I'm generalizing a little, so feel free to use an example if that makes it easier. But how should an early founder think about this so they know the right points to make a pivot? They know when they're working on something that's probably not on the right path. Yeah, so there's, I've seen some recent analytics tools out there, and there was a great presentation at South by this year about using data to scale. And so um, I don't recall the specifics of that, but you know, when I'm advising founders or talking about what's happening, you know, we're looking at the different uses metrics. And I like to get founders to find a power user, if you will. And so if you can find somebody that's really leveraging your tool and is an expert at using your tool, then they're going to give you insights into the kind of value you're creating for them. And then you want to see, okay, is this something that I can spread across the market? And so if you don't have any power users, then to me that says your solution doesn't really solve a problem in a, a strong way for anybody. Makes sense. And so I, that's probably the first step I encourage people to do is, is find the power users and then really engage with them deeply to figure out how to leverage what they're doing and how they're finding success with their product and, and, then, and then build on that and look for more power users. One thing I, get, I see some founders get not stuck on or straight on, but I talk to early customers that have power users they want X, they want Y, they want this integration, they want that integration. And I've seen a lot of people get stuck in sort of that rabbit hole of, hey, these five people are paying me a decent amount of money. Let me just build everything they want. Right. How, how do you combat that? What's your advice? What's your... Yeah, power users have to align with your vision or else you're going to be, you know, your, your innovators because your innovators will tend to be your power users. And so you have to make sure that they align with where you want to go. Because if they don't, they're going to take you in a different direction, right? And, and adding features for the wrong customer is very troublesome, as you know, right? I mean, you can spend all your time adding features for a customer, and then you just create a very broad, horizontal solution that doesn't really solve the problem in a unique way for anybody because you've got so many features. 
how does thinking about this change from early stage to I have decent revenue coming in middle stage to more later stage established company, how, how should a founder think about ensuring that they've sustained fit throughout, they've sustained the right momentum with the product, chose the right direction? How do you think about that? So I think about it in the terms of the what Steve Plank wrote in the four steps to the epiphany, right? So your first step is customer discovery, where you're looking at the problem and do I solve the problem for the customer? Your second step is customer validation. So now you're more directly focused on the customer, less focused on the product, but making sure that the customer is solving their problem in a way that's going to kind of create a sense of urgency or a, a need for them to, or a desire for them to pay for this product, right? And then, so you've got, I've confirmed that I can solve the problem. I've confirmed that a customer exists that needs this problem solved. Then your third step is customer creation. And so that's where you're identifying what's the best channel to get to this customer. Got it. And so uh, the startups that I'm working with and advising we're trying to get through customer creation before Series A, because we want to go to the Series A investors and say, "Hey, we know we know the problem. We have the solution. We know the customer, and we know how to get to that customer." We just need to put fuel on the fire, right? And so we've tested all whether it's a you know a direct sale type effort or whether it's online with inbound marketing, outbound marketing. We've tested all of those, and we have metrics that say we've we found the most cost efficient way to acquire customers. And now we're gonna use your investment to go acquire as many customers as possible. We're not gonna experiment. We're not experimenting with the product. We're not experimenting with finding the customer and we're not experimenting with channels. I see too many startup pitches that for series A, they wanna spend money on testing three different marketing channels. And you can do that, but my my approach is to go into Series A with the one marketing Makes channel sense. that works, and then you know you continually test other channels. But you know I can I've got one channel that works that I can fall back on. Yeah, and I think the goal there is also when you're raising a Series A, you you don't have infinite runway. You need to right. efficiently use dollars. You need to know how to use them. You don't want to raise like a two million dollar Series A, spend half of it figuring out where to put the money and then you're like oh i don't have enough to acquire because even if i spend all of this i don't have enough revenue to be profitable you're still burning whatever right um i do like that thinking of understanding where to spend where to put fuel on the fire and then go ahead right that turns your a into a growth round which is ideal it doesn't always happen yeah. but that's ideal yeah um, lately, uh, I went to SF in Jan, met a lot of people. I constantly hear people, oh, I'm raising a seed plus. I'm raising a pre-seed A. I'm raising, And I feel like it's just ways for people to structure rounds because they still haven't figured out what the product and solution is. And so right. you can't go raise a Series A to still test an idea because no one's really going to do that. So I just find it interesting that there's all these terms of rounds there's so many and at the core yeah. of it i'm like for me it's like i i would consider everything like a seed or an angel round and and then a series a like i would just do two buckets either you have a solution that works or you don't yeah everything else is just you either have this product market fit concept at some level or you yeah. don't yeah and so your seed until you have it and your a plus yeah. after that yeah when do you think a company or a founder should start thinking about building a secondary product? And in my experience, a secondary product is either to increase LTV from a customer, increase, decrease churn maybe, or maybe open up a slightly new customer base to you know build a company. At what point does that make sense? And the reason I ask that is you said, hey, Series A, you're putting food on the fire. Okay, let's say I figured it out. I've got customers. I've gotten a decent percent of the market, but you know I still need to keep growing. Yeah. At what point does solution B come into the picture? I 
I mean, my encouragement on that would be don't look at solution B until your growth rate on your primary product has slowed down. Okay. You know, the the typical SAS growth, SAS growth rate is, you know, um, was it 2x, 2x, 3x, 3x to get to 100 million. Yeah. I, I think that path to 100 million is so all in that if you're trying to add a second product, you're, it's just not possible. Now, are you expanding features and going deeper into the customer solution? Yes, but as far as, you know, do I need to have a second product because I think my sales of the first product are tailing off, it may be the case where your first product's not going to get to 100 million, you start to see it tail off, and now you want to bring in another product. Yeah, makes sense. No, I like that. I also think it's very easy for teams and founders to get very distracted, right? Because I feel like this dynamic of I raise money, there's investor pressure, I got to show growth rate, and founders start believing, oh, the number matters more than my understanding of the problem, the solution, and knowing that, hey, I have a plan, I'm going to execute on the plan. Maybe instead of 24 months, it's going to take me 36 months. But I feel like the notion of investor pressure forces founders to make decisions like, oh, let me add another revenue right. stream. Let me, do, let me do this tactic. Let me try to another channel because there's the pressure of like, hey, you got to show me like that in IRR, internal rate of return or whatever. And it's tough. I mean, a few years ago, there was a, um, a little company in Austin and I went to the, they had the hired CEO, so it wasn't the founding CEO. Yeah. I think the founding CEO had, he'd actually been replaced by this hired CEO and he was talking about how they were going after three markets in parallel and he made the comparison that, you know, I'm essentially building the plane as we're flying it. And the uh, founder I was with at the time um, that we were working together, he said, see, I'm doing what we should be doing. Well, a couple years later, that CEO was out. The original founder was back and they were down to one product. And so, and then they eventually sold that one product to a, a large company. But I think you take on a lot of risk when you dilute the focus of your team by yeah. saying we're going to go after three markets. And and I I see startups do it all the time. I don't this is not necessarily a right or a wrong way to do it. You just got to understand that two markets is not twice as hard. I mean, it's there's some multiplier effect in there to bring that complexity into a business that's not mature yet. Yeah, 100%. When I was in SF in Jan, as part of the on-deck cohort, someone was giving a talk. They said something similar like, hey, I really understand the space. I'm from the space. I am both CEO, CPO, let me drive the solution home. The board was like, you should bring in a CPO. He's like, I know what I'm doing. Trust me. Yeah. Pressured him into hiring a CPO. Okay. Found a executive recruiting firm, paid them 120 K hired a CPO, paid the CPO like 350 K three months in, he went aboard. He's like, it's not working. We're not vibing. doesn't work. His style doesn't work with me. I'm like, okay. They're like, you can give it a couple more months. Again, push him into this situation. He's like, okay. Comes back. He's like, it's not where he's like, fine, you can you fire him. They delayed it so far that he lost the six-month uh, clawback with the recruiting firm. Oh. So they couldn't even hire him a new person. Yeah. He's like, half a million dollars later, later, I'm in the same spot I was six months ago just because I didn't trust my gut instinct. And that's why I was bringing this up of sometimes there's this notion of investor pressure versus... I know what I'm doing. I know what's right. Let me trust my gut and keep doing it. And founders tend to sway on the side of, hey, you gave me the money. Let me say it. It is hard. It's hard to push back on the people who gave you the money and say, yeah, I'm not going to do what you recommend. Yeah. And the reason I bring that up is I wanted to segue into you co-found, you co-founded Longview Tech Ventures, your GP there. Yep. I think you focus on earlier stage investments. What are three things you look for, or it doesn't have to be three, what are things you look for when a company comes to you and gives you a pitch? That's a great question, because the, so the original thesis for Longview Technology Ventures was that that was back in 2018 when I was doing fractional CFO work. 
And so I was seeing a lot of opportunities to invest, if you will, as the last check-in. Got it. And so that's kind of the ideal in a seed round. Last and, check in, uh, in a particular round. You right. Mean. And so yeah. you know the founders are raising 500K. You don't want to be the first check-in because you don't know if they're going to get yeah. the 450, the 450 yeah. or whatever. And ideally, you want to be the last check-in. And I didn't understand this concept at first because I actually heard some investors say that to us when I was at an exorcist. And they said, well, we, we like to be the last check-in. And I thought, yeah, well, doesn't everybody? And then they said something that was interesting. They said, what we find is that sometimes founders will get ahead of, their operating plan will get ahead of their fundraising plan. And so, for instance, at Nexusis, we were trying to raise $5 million. We raised two and a half, and so we started executing our $5 million plan. And then we couldn't we, come in that. We took trip. the focus off of fundraising, um, which is dangerous. And so we weren't able to get the rest of the two and a half million. And, and when you're executing on a $5 million plan, you only get two and a half million, you run out of money quick. Yeah. And so one of the things that I look for is what's your runway? Got it. Um, because I've got to, I've got to size that with my check. And so, for instance, if, if I'm, we write a check that's anywhere from 25000 to 200000 And so if I'm looking at this investment and saying, I want to write a 25K check, and you're burning 200K a month, well, I don't even buy you a week. Yeah. Right? And so there's a mismatch between my investment intent and your need for yeah. runway. And so that's one thing. And then the other thing is I look at... Um, whether or not the entrepreneurs are solid on their vision and strategy, because I've, I've seen some entrepreneurs that will kind of shift based on what they hear, not from the market, but from investors. Okay. And so if the message is changing based on their most recent conversation, then it's like, okay, I, I don't want to get in until you settle in on what your message like. Makes sense. But, I had this, I was meeting with this one founder. I was really excited about what they were doing. And it was our second meeting. Um, and they came into the meeting and they said, oh, good news. We're now a data company. Okay. And, I and said, it what, didn't start out as that. What do you mean you're now a data company? Oh, well, we talked to our advisor who came from this industry and they're a data company. And really the, the, the big opportunity for us is to be a you know, to sell the data because once we, we'll have a rich set of data once we get a bunch of users, and so we're we're focused now on being a data company. And I thought that's not that's not a good strategy when you don't have users. Because Facebook is a data company now, yeah, yeah. but they didn't start out as a data company. So makes sense. Are there things you look at to underwrite a deal outside of? intuition you look at hey you're going to raise around runway are there particular things you're looking for before you underwrite and put in a deal um so i'm looking for uh, what metrics are they tracking what do they think is important um because we are somewhat vertical agnostic okay um, i'm looking for what interests they have from later stage founders kind of the ideal introduction is okay a series a vc firm calls me up and says hey jeff we'd like you to look at this company they're too early for us got it but we'd like we're interested in what they're doing we can't participate in this 500k round because it's too small but if they can hit these certain metrics then we'd be interested in leading their series a that's a good signal it's a good signal um and also i look at you know what's their experience have they have they done it before? Um, the fund started out as a, a first-time founder fund, um, which is tough. Ten years is short for a first-time founder fund, I'm finding. Um, and what I learned is that there has to be somebody in the team that is not a first-time founder. Got it. And so then I, I look for, okay, who? how do you round out your team? What's the I look at the cap table to see, okay, what what is the ownership of the other people on the cap table? Is it right? Is it aligned with what their value they're bringing? Um, 
And to clarify, when you say first time founder fund, you're investing in first time founders. Is it tough from a deal flow perspective, from an outcome perspective, or tough in what regard? Tough in a regard that um, first time founders tend to take longer to get to where they need to go. Yeah. Um, a lot more figuring out. To and I know other VCs in the Austin area that will not invest in first time founders because they take an exit too early. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, who wouldn't? You start your first company and somebody offers you $10 million okay. and you're the only, you're the primary shareholder, why not yeah. exit? And so um, I didn't see that as a challenge necessarily, but just, um, I mean, we, we structured our notes or safes with an anticipation that they may take an exit before it converts. Okay. And so there's, there's um, certain terms in the safe notes that if you're Makes not sense. considering that scenario, your return could be really low if they don't convert before they exit. So, yeah. so we look at that. Okay. Do you care about market size? Are you looking at any particular market size? Do you care about technology risk? Or, because I think what you talk about is a lot of like founder execution. Um, yeah. Do you look at those aspects? How much does that matter in terms of your decision overall? I look at can this, do I believe this can be a public company? Okay. Because I think in the VC play, you've got to have line of sight to going public. Yeah. Now, you, you can exit prior to that, but to get the VC level returns, mm -hmm. yeah. you need to be in the path to go public. And so there's some stuff that I see that, okay, this, you'd be better off bootstrapping this, or this is a lifestyle business, or I don't, I don't see the, the market opportunity. Um, I mean, I teach entrepreneurship, so I'm a stickler for market sizing, Yeah. but it's a challenge to to do that, but I often see it done wrong. And Are you a top-down market size person or a bottom-up? Both. I think it's got to be validated in both directions. Okay. Any recommendations or tools or resources for just market sizing that you think are particularly helpful? Um, I think it's helpful to look at the unit economics of your business. Okay. And then really get clear on and your ideal customer profile, like who has this problem? I see, I hear so many founders say, well, everybody could use this, you know, or this is, it's only $3 a month, everybody's gonna add this app on their phone. And the truth is that doesn't happen. It's, it's funny you say that. I don't know who I was listening to, some podcast, and the guy said, a lot of founders in New York and SF don't understand that most of America can't afford a Netflix subscription. And then when you want, when you're adding another subscription, they, and they have to make a decision, oh, do I want X? They have to find something to pop off their list yeah. to be able to afford your $10 a month subscription. And I think a lot of people who are like in the SF New York, like tech start a bubble, don't understand that, like you said, five, 10, $20 a month subscription Right. Very, like a very small percentage of the American population is going to realistically sign up, afford, and stay a customer for the lifetime that you want them to stay a customer. Right, because the people that are in those areas are in the top 1%, 100%. of earners. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. So they look at it and think, well, I would, I'd spend $3 a month for this app. Yeah. 300 million households in the United States, that's our market opportunity. So, yeah. And every time I see an ad for an app, we're like, oh, connect us to your credit card and we'll tell you all your subscriptions that you don't have. And my first thought is someone who has unwanted subscriptions is not the right customer for some people who are more cash out, budget friendly. They don't have unwanted subscriptions. So you're yeah. catering to a very small demographic. And then the top half of the market they don't really care if there's a couple extra subscriptions here or there. They probably use them once in a while. It's too much effort to unsubscribe, resubscribe when they want it. You're catered to a very small market. So I'm very curious actually how many users are active and like use something like that because of the same numbers. Yeah. Um, market that is. So you mentioned 
people get market sizing pretty um, wrong most of the time. Founders get them wrong right. most of the time, yeah. Right, and the example I put in my book is, um, and I've heard this said by founders, hey, we're, this is a $400 billion market opportunity because we are in enterprise software. And I think, yeah, but you're not, your software does not do every single thing that enterprise software does, right? Enterprise software is a very broad field from CRM to probably um, project management to everything yeah. everything in between, yeah. right? And yeah. so to say that, well, we can, we can, our total available market is 400 billion is just incorrect. And that's, that's an extreme example, but yeah. it kind of gives you a thought of, okay, where does, where does this sizing data come from? I was, um, early in my career, I was in a meeting with uh, the marketing person who had told us, so I was in design engineering, and, and she was asking us to develop a chip for this customer because she said, this is, this is a billion dollar opportunity. And so I'm, I'm sitting there with my boss at the time, who's a VP of engineering, and, we're, and, and he's, he's asking questions of this customer. Okay, you guys do a billion dollars in this industry. How much of that is services? And the customer said, oh, that's about 80% is services. Okay, and what's the next 20%? And he broke down the 20%, and it turned out that the market opportunity for our part with this customer was maybe 100K. And so, you know, you walk into the meeting, and the marketing person is saying, this is this customer meeting we're having right now you guys this is a billion dollar opportunity and we walk out and my boss had kind of whittled it down to a hundred K opportunity and that just that totally changes what you're willing to invest 100%. in a product if 100%. if you really understand how the customer's going to use it how many they're going to buy you know you can't just look at the financial statements or the investor report and say oh these guys do a billion dollars in this industry if we're doing a chip for that industry, then it's a billion dollar opportunity, so. Makes sense. On the VC side, what was one thing that just startled you getting into VC and investing that you were unaware of being on the other side, trying to raise, being part of startups and companies, being an advisor to companies? I, the LP interface, so, you know, VC funds have limited partners and what you, so they, I mean, we raise capital. Yeah. I have to go to my investors and say, this is what I'm going to do. This is why you should give me money. Yeah. And you want to stick to that thesis because that's what your investors gave you money for. And so that's, that was a surprise to me to think about it in those terms and think, okay, I, I think this opportunity is really exciting, but it's in Northern Virginia. And when I told my investors we were doing a technology fund in Central Texas, I said we were, I mean, that was one of the selling points. We're investing in Central Texas. And so I had to think through, okay, is this opportunity in Northern Virginia so compelling that I'm willing to go to my investors in an update or whatever and say, oh, by the way, we made an investment in Northern Virginia. And so that, that's a surprise. And I think a lot of founders don't really realize that, right? Because, and I, I see it all the time when they, because I'll tell them, well, we invest in Central Texas. And they say, well, we have an employee in Central Texas. And I'm like, well, but your, company your that, company's yeah, not yeah. in Central Texas. Your yeah. company's in Southern California or whatever. Yeah. And they'll try to kind of shift the narrative of what they're saying to match your investment thesis and it's like I can't it's I, I can't shift my thesis because that's what I committed in my LPs I'm yeah. going to invest on yeah. and 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 I want to I want to stay true to that thesis and it doesn't really fit with what you're doing you know we don't we don't invest in, in medical and we don't because um, we don't understand I certainly don't invest in crypto um I have very conservative investors in Longview, Texas, and yeah. Midland, and so I can't, they're not the crypto crowd. And so to send out an investor update and say, yeah, we've got investment in crypto, would that'd be crazy. So this is just more my personal curiosity. How difficult is it to raise a fund from LPs? I've never 
raised. Um, so I don't relate. But I'm just genuinely very curious. It's very different when you're raising a fund. Because you're going saying, hey, I'm raising an X million dollar fund. Here's my thesis. Blah, blah, blah. Whatever. Carry generic terms. How... How are those conversations? How difficult is that? Especially if you've never done it before. They're very difficult if you've never done it before. Um, they get easier if you've got a track record. I mean, I, I get a lot of questions from people that want to do their first time fund, and I, I have strategies for how to do that now that I've done it. And it essentially includes not doing a first time fund, but kind of creating a, a fund of angel investments that you've made and then rolling that in calling that fund one and now you're going out to kind of fund two fund two um the other so so you can do that by syndicating deals whether you're investing with friends or whatever or um you know you can do that as an advisor there's some local accelerators where i was recommending hey just take all of these accelerator advisor shares roll it into a single fund entity one, yeah, and yeah. call that fund one um, so, so you want to, you always want to raise fund too. um, fund the first time fund, um, is harder if you haven't had a successful exit. So a successful exit could be as an entrepreneur or as a angel investor. And so limited partners want something that they can hang their hat on or that you can hang your hat on and say, I've done it sort of successfully approval, in the past. Right. Sort of a stamp of approval. Yes. Makes sense. Maybe this is just the product side of my brain. When he said roll everything into fund one and raise the fund two. And I'm like, that just feels like optics. Because yeah. every time you look at like a product update or an internal deck, you're like, we have 10 mil in ARR, but I'm like, okay, if you break that down, it's really like six because you rolled in the credits we gave out because that's theoretical. And like, it just feels like optics in terms of yeah, how you position the language. I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing to do, but I understand that it's basically telling LPs that, hey, I know what I'm doing. I've done this before. I understand the space. So I'm not just winging it. I'm not just going to, you know, throw a dart. Right. Whether that's in the optics of like a fund one, fund two, whether that's credibility, stamp of approval. I understand why it's done. I just always go back to every time I'm seeing internal product updates at a company. I'm like, well, I know these numbers are like made to look nice. But if you really want to break it down, like your billion dollar to 100K example, they don't look this nice, but yeah. you got to make them look nice, right? So, yeah, and I think the the taking kind of some angel investments that you've made or some advisor shares that you have and rolling that into a a fund shows your kind of ability to identify opportunities and also gives you somewhat of a track record and a model to communicate to the VCs. One of the things I struggled with in our, our first time fund was that um, we were raising from real estate investors and they had no, expen no experience yeah. in venture. And so their big question was, well, when do distributions start? And it's like, well, when, Seven we have years. A, when we have an exit. And they're like, well, can't we get, can we get quarterly distributions? I mean, no, <laughs> no, we have to wait. To, and I still have that conversation with yeah, them yeah. today. And, but if you, if I had a kind of a fund one where I could show, okay, this, I made this angel investment on this date and it exited on this date and this was what the result was, that would help communicate, this is, you know, I'm just gonna do this again with more money. And so that's why I think it works. It's a, a little better than kind of the analogy of calling all revenue, product revenue, so. Makes sense, makes sense. Being a VC on the other side, do you have a recommendation on how to reach out to VCs and how to find the right VCs to reach out to? My thesis here is I always recommend founders take a check from someone who's a good investor for their company yeah. and not just take any check. Now, it's easy for me to say that from a point from a place where I don't need to raise a check. And I understand that 
when you're raising, you sort of take whatever check you can get because maybe you need the cash. What's your advice on finding VCs and reaching out to the ones who you think are really good fits? So I think the the best way to do it is to to do research to find out who's who's in your segment in your sector who's who's investing in either fintech or saas or you know whatever you're doing health tech and then look for those investors and then look to see if you've got any common connections got it but also look at have they made investments in a competitor okay um because sometimes either they've made investments in a competitor or they've made an investment in something similar to what you're doing and it didn't work out chances are they're not going to do it again do it again and so uh, there are a lot of databases out there um i'm looking at some now for private equity and venture capital and i mean you look at the price tag and you think wow that's that's a lot of money um like actually i don't honestly don't know what the price of pitch book is now but back in the day we looked at that and said that's that's a lot of money i don't think we can afford that but i think i want to say 30k sa- a year yeah, it would have saved us a few months yeah. of, because there's a lot of family offices, um, angel groups, smaller VCs. Um, but one of the things I coach founders with right now is, okay, you've got existing investors. You've got maybe 20 investors on your cap table. Call those investors and ask them, is there any anybody in your network that I should be talking to? And most of them will say no, but some of them do invest in groups, and yeah. that's who you're looking for. Makes sense. Because the ones that invest in groups will say, "Oh yeah, yeah, I, yeah." There's three of my friends. We just went in on a real estate deal together. You should talk to. Oh, let me make an yeah. introduction. Yeah. Because they want you to be successful. Um, and I, I think a lot of them, if they're not investing with friends if they're just kind of out there on their own and figuring out on their own they're not going to be good referrals anyway makes sense but you've got to ask that question because you don't know who's going to be a good referral who's not going to be a good referral who has a network who doesn't have a network Um, and you also have to consider that some of the people that you talk to some of the people that you're asking for referrals are not in the if you will the mind share of that investor right and what i mean by mind share is that okay i'm a let's say i have a family office and i get an intro from john smith i don't look to john smith for investment advice in any way and so i'm probably not interested in that intro yeah but if you if you know a founder of a portfolio company that i've already invested in so you go through linkedin and you say hey i want to talk to jeff and you look at Okay, who Who's who do Jeff? I know that knows Jeff? Let me go to Jeff's website and see what companies has he invested in. Okay, I'm I'm connected to the founder in one of these companies. That's who you want to ask for an intro. Yeah. Third time I've gotten that advice on this podcast, but yeah. just honing down on that. Sure. <laughs> um, so it's tough. It is it is tough because I get a lot of cold emails and DMs on. How many do you take a look at? So I, because I teach entrepreneurship, I, I look at most of the pitch decks I get. Okay. Because I'm always looking for examples of. Yeah. Good and bad ones. Good and bad. Yeah. Teaching examples. Yeah. Um, but I would say I don't, I don't look at any cold ones right now. From an investment point. From an investment standpoint. Makes sense. But that's, we're five years into the fund right now. And so I can't make a early stage investment because you got to figure I'm, I've got five years to the end of my fund. Yeah. And so now I am, I am actually reaching out to my connections in the later stage funds and saying, hey, if you do an A or a B let me know. that has some room, let me know. Okay. And so those are the referrals I'm getting, and those are the ones that I'm following up on as opposed to, you know, I've got this new technology and I'm raising 750K as my first round. I can't do those anymore. Yeah. So I think we talked about how to reach out how to connect, how to get good intros. One thing that I think founders don't stress upon 
and again, this is an opinion from a point of view of just working with founders, not having raised, just for context. Okay. Um, a lot of founders think that VCs drive the dynamic of the relationship versus I feel like founders should always try to find the VC that thinks the same way they think, <coughs> excuse me, understands their approach, their thinking, understands their risk-taking ability, their product-building mindset. I feel like if you're not a match on that level, every conversation you have for advice or mentorship from that VC, if you take a check, is going to end up in some sort of argument or discussion where VC saying do X, you're like, no, I'm going to do Y, and like you never come to common ground. Yeah. How important do you think that is? Do you focus on that? Do you ask certain questions? And how can a founder look out for those things? So sort of a loaded question, but feel free to answer, however. Yeah, I focus on that more now after making like, I think 11 investments and seeing, you know, some, some founders are interested in what I have to say and some are not. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it, it goes both ways. I think, like you said, you want to, you want to find the investor that you connect with and think about it as a, a mentor mentee relationship. Yeah. And I, I'll use this example that I heard from one of my MBA professors. He said, um, he told a story of, he, he decided he wanted a certain person to be his mentor. And the ment he met with the mentor and the mentor said, I want you to do X, Y, and Z. And he's like, well, I don't mind doing X and Y, but I don't, I don't want to do Z. And he's like, no, I think you ought to do Z. And so at that point, he had a decision to make. Either I'm going to do Z and trust this mentor, or I'm going to go find another mentor. Um, and so I take that lesson into kind of the investor relationship, right? If you don't, if you're talking to the investor and they're giving you pushback of what, about what you're doing and you don't like that pushback, don't take money from them, right? And if you guys aren't, guys, gals, let's be gender neutral here. If, if you're not connected on the strategy and you're, you're very firm on this is the strategy that I want to take, then you know, you're better off, as you said, right? You're better off going to another investor and, and finding somebody with alignment. And, I, and it's a hard thing to do because when you're a founder raising capital, and I've been in that kind of the supporting role of, you know, working with multiple yeah. CEOs raising capital, you think that this meeting, this is, you know, you, I, I know how much is in the checking account. This one's got to work. Let's just take it. Let's yeah. Let's over. Yeah, I, I know this. It didn't seem like we didn't connect on a few issues, but we really need the money. And those are usually the mistakes because you're you're now you've got somebody on your cap table that is is not a, a not aligned with where you want to go. That's when you sign like a forex preference term sheet and get screwed out of whatever exit, but. Um, well, forex preferences are bad in general. So, <laughs> what's been your most awkward interaction or pitch with a founder? And I say this because I was at a South by VC. And you're putting thing. me on the spot. Um, I, I was at a South by VC thing, and a VC got pitched right next to a urinal, and. One of my friends saw it and, I was, and he was like, this is not the time or the place. But has, have there been just an instance where you're like, not, not the best time to pitch me, but it's been sort of. There, a, yeah. So when, so when I was new to having a small fund and I started going to these events to try to meet founders. Um, and there's some, some events where they'll put different color stickers yeah. on your name tag. Like right? investor founder, yeah. Um, and I remember being at one event where, you know, there was a very, very eager founder. He saw my little investor Love color it. name tag thing. And um, 
and he just he kind of he went into his pitch and and it was the right place for that pitch but i said well we don't we don't do med tech or whatever yeah. you know we're focused more on this so then he shifted his pitch to tell me how oh well we're not really med tech we're this which was what i just told him we invest in and i'm like and and he wouldn't he wouldn't let it go. I mean, he was insistent. And I think for a couple months after that, I, I avoided those kind of meetings. Or if I went to a meeting like that, I didn't put the Invest. investor sticker on my name tag because I was like, I don't. And, and I think you see that in, um, in the industry and in the networking groups around Austin. You don't, you don't get principals you get from the VC analysts. firms. You get you, analysts. You get the analysts. You get the entry-level people. And, and I, that makes sense to, to some extent. But even... You know, I've seen they're not even some of the GPs in the local funds aren't even on panels anymore. I mean, they're sending like their analysts that are like two years out of school and yeah. go do this panel for me. And so I think because of that, because these networking events have been such a kind of confront, not confrontational is maybe a strong word, but, you know, you get founders that just are, once they get you in their circle they won't let go and they're maniacally focused on i've got to pitch you my thing and i've got to tell you what and why you need to invest and i can't believe that you're not interested in hearing my pitch and it's like i'm i'm here to meet a lot of people and just i'm not even going to remember this mm -hmm. why waste your time yeah. and so i don't fortunately i don't have any situation where i was pitched in next to a urinal but <laughs> I, I mean that was that's one that comes to mind where i remember where where i was in the event and i'm that was the last time I went to that event. And yeah. Um, the reason I ask is I, I run a service firm, software services, right? So mm -hmm. I never once mentioned I do that. It's something I do. I have an agency. Great. I will never say that because I've noticed that folks in Austin, not even anywhere, the second you say I have an agency, they'll automatically associate all these connotations with what I'm going to do. They're like, okay, you're going to sell me. You're going to do this. Yep. I'm like, I have no interest in telling you about what I, you asked me what I do. So I told you I have this podcast now. So I'm like, Hey, I'm a podcast host. I don't even say I have an agency anymore. Yeah. Um, and it's just that connotation of, I associate people associate agency owner with, Hey, he's going to obsessively sell me whatever service he has and find a way to fit it in. And I think s same thing happens in like investor founder meetups where, Everyone's there like, I got to pitch you. And my take is these places are more to make the connection and sort of convert your cold intro into a warm intro. Get their email, get their number, whatever. Right. And follow up and be like, hey, I had a great conversation. I'd love to tell you about my thing X, Y, Z. And if they're interested, they will reply. If they didn't have a good conversation, then they will not reply. At which point it doesn't even matter whether you pitch them that day or you send them a cold dm you're at the same place your job there is to leave a good first impression it could matter less that's my personal take i don't yeah. know if you agree or disagree but i i think you want to do the elevator pitch i think you want to spend 30 seconds just seeing if there's interest yeah you know touching on a, a few of the high points of and, and there's great programs around town for for doing that i in um, i've heard of a program in boston and i think they ought to do it at capital factory where they actually will put mentors on the elevator and you oh, go into the elevator and as it rides up to the floor interesting you get your 30 seconds to pitch and then the mentor stays on the yeah. entrepreneur gets off a new entrepreneur gets on and they have 30 seconds down interesting and so i think that would be fun but you're not going to get a check in that meeting yeah your goal is to make the connection to plant the seed and if they're interested they'll tell you but you've got to understand that 99 maybe that's a little high but 95 90 percent of the people you talk to are your startup is not going to align with their thesis yeah 100 percent. or your personality is not going or they're in a different place or you know whatever it may, they may be in the middle of fundraising and not actively investing because you know the bigger funds they go through cycles right every two years they're out back to market and and they may they may be out you know um networking to stay active in the community but maybe not actively writing checks yeah. so yeah. um and 
this is not advice for anyone listening. I personally, if I'm going to go build my startup, I would not raise until I have an idea. I know it works and I need fuel to put on the fire. Yeah. I've built enough product. I know the true cost of development. I feel like I'm technical and product enough where there are enough tools available nowadays where if you're motivated enough and you truly believe in the idea, you can get a very good minimum viable product out in market, test it and fail for five to 10 grand. Yeah. And that's also pushing it if you don't want it to look good. And I fundamentally believe that if you're raising a pre-seed round for exploration um, of like, I have an idea, let me go figure out what the solution is. You're doing it from a point of privilege of you've raised, you've exited twice before, you have the ability to go raise a million dollar round on your, I don't know what to call it, like your credentials yeah credentials and that's again a place of privilege for first time founders i fundamentally believe if you're motivated enough you don't need a lot of capital to go and try out your idea there's enough resources tools no code ai you can grind it out do your job work at night part of being an entrepreneur um because it, once you take a check for someone outside of the pressure, you also have a fiduciary responsibility to do the best you can. Yeah. If you raise a check, it doesn't mean, oh, I can just chill and like, you know, take it slow. And I feel like you don't need to put yourself in that position in today's world. Like you don't need that to validate it. You can get much later. You can get much better terms. You can truly understand what do I need money for? Why do I need to raise? Again, my opinion. And I'm not saying that. Yeah, the way that's to go, certainly but, true in software. Yeah. But I mean, there are some industries. No, hundred percent. I, I do need yeah. some money, and I would, I would say that. Um, there's a level of privilege in in different industries and different things, right? And and sometimes when you're reading that this second time founder raised a $5 million round, he or she may have put $4 million in. Yeah. Right? And they may have said, I'm going to fund my company. And three of their friends said, hey, I want in. And so they're like, okay, well, I'll let you put in 200K yeah, or yeah. 400K or whatever. And so um, that's, that's kind of what I see when they're multiple stage founders. Yeah. Um, I don't see a lot of second or third time founders not putting their own money in 100%. but they do they do want external validation so yeah. they do want somebody else on the to write a check because that does say okay i you're not just um you know deluding yourself and thinking that this is a market i actually agree with yeah. you and i'm willing to put my money also i think it's very contextual it's lower risk right like if you only had a 10 million dollar exit 10 million is a lot but if you're going to put $2 million in a company, that's a big chunk of, like, your net worth, right? Yep. And so it's also a lot of context here. But, um, again, we'll cut it up to say that everything I said, if you're building in SaaS, I would, I would SaaS do the boots. Yeah, yeah. yeah. SaaS no, I, I agree that there are spaces where you need cash to, like, prototype med tech hardware. That I agree with. Caveat with everything I said was SaaS, but, but I yeah I agree. I, SaaS is a different thing because you can and I always I so my son's a developer and I always had this uh, I would keep pitching him ideas because he was he was a computer science student at UT and all his roommates were computer science. I'm thinking you know right there, that's like a you know if I can find the right idea, there's a hackathon in that apartment and yeah. We could yeah. get a product out yeah. in 24 hours or something. Um, but I never, during that time when he was in college, I couldn't convince him of the right idea. And so I kind of missed out on that opportunity. Yeah. But I still, I do think that there's, you know, if you're, if you're not a coder and you think, well, I want to do a product, there's two ways to do a product, right? Is to find a co-founder who is a coder or to take out a second mortgage on your house and pay $30,000 
to a development team to put together yeah. a product. And I would, I would recommend you find a co-founder who's Perfect. a coder and have them, you know, hack together a, a minimum course, viable yeah. product that yeah. you can start testing in the market. But yeah, you know, oftentimes I've, and that's discouraging. And, and we've talked about that is, is to know that, you know, when they come in and they're pitching me to raise a yeah. million dollars or whatever, and they say, well, we've spent $80,000 of our money developing this product. And I'm looking at it thinking, it's a piece of shit. you probably shouldn't <laughs> have done that. Yeah. And I think it also comes from a point of view of people just don't understand. And like, even, even at my firm, folks come to me with, I want to build this. And there's so much scope creep that happens because yep. they'll go down a path and be like, I don't like that. Let me, let's go here. I'm like, I can't just build you a new page. I got to build you new endpoints, new database table to store the data you want to store. It's not just a spin up a new page and do that. I think people don't understand. So I go through this whole scoping phase of like, hey, we're just going to work in Figma yeah. until we're aligned. Once you're aligned, I give you timeline and I start building. If you want to change anything, it goes through a full process. Like, because then you're not happy. I'm frustrated that you're, you're giving me shit about timelines because you changed the scope 18 times. And I'm, I'm trying to get better and strict about that. I understand pivots are needed. Yeah. I only ask you understand that it takes time to pivot. Like, I can't just go 180 and, like, do it in a day because everything's built. I'm like, it's not built. But anyways. Right. And it's, it's a little different if you've, if you've got a developer on staff that can, yeah, I'll, I'll stay up all night doing that yeah, kind of thing versus, 100%. you know, let me call Abby yeah. And, yeah. and redirect the team. Yeah. Um, sweet. I like ending every interview with a couple questions. So, what you've you've had an extensive career. You have a fun fractional CFO. You're doing a lot of things, writing books. Do you have a support system, and what's been your support system throughout your journey? Whether professional entrepreneurship, investing, have you had a? What would you say is your support system? I would say that for most of my career, I did not have a support system, and that was a big mistake. And so, um, I think since, um, I'll tell you, this is funny. My wife will laugh at this. So, um, in 2019, when I went full-time at Longview Equity, she said, um, I want you to keep this job. You have a coach. Um, you've got a, so I've, you need an executive coach. I found one for you. You have a call with her on Thursday at two o'clock. And so, um, you don't have to hire her, but you need to hire somebody. Yeah. And so, so I've been with that executive coach since 2019 and that's okay. my support system now. Um, nice. a big part of it. And I would say that, you know, my, my wife has been a big supporter. Um, it's been ups and downs of any marriage. Um, you know, we have four kids and so that can be a challenge. Um, we were in Silicon Valley in the nineties when our kids were young and I love to work. And so missed out on a lot of things, but um, now there's more, I, I go through phases of doing, you know, different exercise routines, different diet routines, different meditation routines. And I, I'm experimenting, I'm back to a, a certain exercise routine now that I've, I, I think is going to work. Um, I'm, I'm adding I'm going to add the cold plunge in nice. next week nice. and experiment with that, see what that nice. does. Um, nice. But I'm finding what works for me. Um, and I think early in my career, I didn't, I just focused on work. I didn't really care about, you know, um, life relationships, taking myself, right. taking care of myself, taking care of my health, um, relationships or anything like that. And so I, I missed out on a lot and, and that's all probably been corrected since you know 2019 i started working with an executive coach and they'll they help you understand your priorities and then Makes live sense. your priorities someone you want to plug or no the coach um alicia marie i don't think she's taking any more clients that's fine so. well we'll still we'll still link them if we um we'll we'll get that for me later 
She's well, the best coach, but maybe not the best for everybody. Yeah. And I think very it's it's the same as finding a mentor. You got to I, I don't like using the word like you got to vibe with them, but that's the best way I can explain of how to find someone to work with you and help you. You just got to have the right vibe with them. Um, I, outside of principles and thinking, all that, but I would sum it up as vibe. I don't know if that's the best word. Right. No, I think that's a good word. I mean, my, it's funny. So my wife is a coach. And so, you know, I pushed, when she said, you, you got, I've scheduled you a call on Thursday with your executive coach. I said, well, why can't you coach me? And she's like, no, I can't coach you. I'm not going to coach you. Yeah. yeah. Um, because it, there's different personalities require different kind of coaches and so um you know i i I encourage the founders that i work with to get an executive coach and in fact you know there's there's an executive coach character in the book that kind of walks the founder through just the the realization that he wasn't following lean startup he thought he was yeah he was using a few buzzwords um and thought that you know the few demos that he had booked would, meant that he had product market fit to the level that he understood product market fit. And so um, so part of his journey to f- getting things back on track involves two coaches. One is an executive coach who actually is an executive coach and then a product market fit coach. And that's where I think you have to be careful is the, the product market fit coach is not really a coach. It's a, it's a consultant. Yeah. But in this, in the book, and so there are consultants out there who call themselves coaches. Like they're a CEO consultant, but they'll call themselves a CEO coach. And they're not doing the same thing that an executive coach would do. And 100%. so you just have to, you have to be aware of that. And, and they both have a place, but you have to know going into it. Because I, I think that you may have some expectations, certainly if you've been with an executive coach before and you switch over to this other CEO coach and you think they're going to be the same way and you find out, well, they're trying to tell me what to do, and I don't, I don't want my coach to tell me what to do, and yeah, it's a very different experience. And so, so there's two coaching characters in my book, and, and one of my one of my early reviewers said, "What is what is this? Is a book about coaching? It's coach's book. What what's this all about?" And I was like, "Well, the product market fit coach is really a consultant. So, but but that doesn't roll off the tongue like product market fit coach. It makes sense." What what are three resources that you would recommend to listeners? And I know you brought some. I books, brought my but. three favorite books because I knew you were going to ask me this question. So this is this is the first one is The War of Art. And so I've I've read this thing multiple times, and it's it's pretty short. I mean, each page is a little short yeah. thing. Of what causes? So The War of Art is about breaking through creative barriers. Okay. And so I wanted to write a book. And so, like, I've, I've read this multiple times to try to get through the psych myself yeah. up. I've read draft number four by uh, McVie. I've read um, Bird by Bird by Lamont. Um, and I kept looking for, okay, what's, what's, what do I need to do? Um, but this one was. Nice. My favorite as far as kind of thinking through, you know, because he has different exam- examples of resistance. Nice. And, I mean, there was one in here that I just read it and it just, like, pissed me off. And I was like, <laughs> done with that book. Um, my second favorite book is The Mom Test. Heard a lot about this. It's on my list. Haven't read this yet, but I, I, I know the gist of it. So, yeah, this is a great book. And, and I, I, it's on my list of startup resources in my book. Um, so Rob Fitzpatrick is a software engineer. And so what he learned and what I, I hear a lot of entrepreneurs do is so he, he was going out and talking to customers and what he found was that everybody told him his product was great and nobody would buy it. He's like, well, it doesn't make sense. Why is everybody telling me how great my product is but nobody wants to buy it? And so he realized that he, when he was doing these customer interviews, he was spending all his time talking about the product and not really learning about the customer. And so as a result of that, he put together this guidelines of how do you ask questions of the customer in a way that even your mom couldn't lie to you. Yeah. And then this is, um, this is my favorite book of all time, The Innovator's Solution. Have you heard of this one? No, I have not. 
So this is from the 90s, which is maybe why you haven't heard of this. And I, I have not read this. So this is Clayton Christopher. And so Chris, I'm sorry, Christensen, Clayton Christensen. Clayton Christopher is our local celebrity. So Clayton Christensen. And so he's written multiple books, um, The Innovator's Dilemma, The Innovator's Solution. Okay, I think, yeah, I've heard of them. Yes, I haven't um, read them. He's, I've heard of Innovator's Dilemma. Yeah, and so uh, that's a great book as well. But I like this one because it kind of, so the innovator's dilemma raises all these issues, and then this one addresses it. Got it. And so that's nice. This was, I think I probably read this in the early 2000s, and this was instrumental in my thinking about, you know, how do I shift, kind of what I'm doing from the engineering side to more marketing and enterprise focus. Nice. I like it. And the last thing, I do the segment where I ask every guest question for a future guest. Okay. And so your question. How do you keep your business a passion rather than a noose around your neck? How do you find balance? Man. How do I keep it a passion? I. So what I've been doing recently is looking at, okay, what. Makes you happy. Well, what is, I do both. So what, what did I not enjoy this week? Okay. And what did I enjoy? And how do I shift kind of my consulting work so that I'm doing more of what I enjoy versus what I don't enjoy? Makes sense. And I think in the past, so I started doing fractional CFO work in 2014. In the past, I would have been like, I, every, everybody that asks for help, I'll help them. But now I'm starting to turn away clients because it's like I don't, I don't see alignment. Too early, too late, expecting the wrong thing. Or, you know, I... It's like one of the questions I got recently was, okay, well, if I were to bring you on full time as a CFO, what would you do? And I'm like, well, here's the three things I would do first. And he's like, well, I don't, I don't think that's what we need to do. Okay. <laughs> then you don't, you don't need to bring me on as a CFO. Yeah. Makes sense. And so it's that I think is, is that I'm going to go with that as my answer. Is, I like is it. This, I like is, it. You know, I meet with my, um, my business partner once a week and we go over, okay, what worked, what didn't work last week. And then we kind of shift makes sense because part of it is shifting the message of okay are are we going to you know if, okay if you didn't enjoy doing that project and that product line is on the website should we take it off and it's like yeah we should probably take that off because i don't want to do any more of those projects or i need to hire somebody to do that part of the project makes so kind of we're looking at the balances there but i would say that's that's a big thing i've been doing this time around that keep it from being a noose around my neck What's your question for a future guest? My question for a future guest is what has been the most influential teacher or professor in your life and why? Okay. I like it. It could be grade school. It could be high school. It could be college. I like it. Very different from what we've had so far. So yeah, I like it's it. It's not as entrepreneurial as your other questions. But no. Um, great conversation. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate your time where can readers find you what do you want to plug where can they reach out and we'll link everything in show notes and description so i'm really active on linkedin um that's the best place to reach me you can get my book on amazon i've got book number two in process nice so um i i'm really excited about book number two nice it's a very different it's still on the leadership fable genre if you will but it's a very different story and the initial feedback has been really good i like it cool but yeah we'll link everything i appreciate your time thank you for coming on and we'll get you on for episode two in a couple months and talk about book number two awesome sounds good thank you thank you for coming on jeff all right thanks Abby.